you know, all, all of the water we have has been around for the entire, you know, the existence of Earth. So it's all recycled water, really. Like we are drinking dinosaur pee or who knows, you know, what that water, what it traveled through in the past. So we can clean any water to be drinking water quality again. This is the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. Revitalizing the world together. Welcome back, everybody. This is Neil Collins, and I am the host of the Regenerative Real Estate Podcast. As always, it is so humbling to be able to do this work and to deliver this kind of content to you with incredible thought leaders and action takers, icons in the industry, and even iconoclast. I am really excited to get into our show today. A bit of a disclaimer though, right now I am recording the intro after we had recorded the show by a week. And whenever we were recording, all hell was breaking loose on the West Coast. And I was recording in Portland, Oregon. Our guest, Laura Allen, was in Eugene, Oregon, which I didn't realize. Uh, But Eugene, just like Portland, was going through some pretty big traumatic climate events. Uh, Call it poor land management. Call it climate change. It is the same side of the same coin, not even different sides, uh, where we are going through some pretty dramatic life events that we're, we're certainly going to have to buckle up for. And it makes the conversations that we're having today on this show so important because we're not only talking about regenerative real estate, but we're really getting into what that looks like. Uh, today's show is about water and is about gray water systems. We do touch on black water systems. And I want to let you know that we need to start thinking about what our impact is. Where are we getting the critical things that keep us going, keep our houses going, keep our lives going? Where are they coming from? And importantly about the water, where are they going after we use them? And how are we conceptualizing that? You know, a lot of the times, because we are borrowing so much inspiration from regenerative agriculture, it's quite easy to think, okay, this is what a living system looks like in the landscape in a rural area. But most people, I'm finding that they're having a hard time conceiving, well, what is the impact that I have in in an urban setting? And most people listening to this are going to be tuning in from an urban area. And if we're not seeing the linkages between what, what our patterns are and what our society looks like in an urban sphere and how it impacts everything else, then we are really just blind to how we are part of living systems that are nested within living systems. And so as I'm recording this, I ended up evacuating from the West Coast and I sought refuge with my parents in Louisiana. And it's amazing to connect with family, uh, but I knew that I was gonna be releasing this podcast whenever I was down here. And so I started to do some research into the watershed that I am now in. And I found out that I am in the Comey watershed Originally, or whenever I recorded this podcast, I was in the Columbia Slough watershed. Uh, but an interesting thing about the Columbia or about the Comet River watershed is that I'm in South Louisiana in my hometown of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and we get our water from an aquifer that pulls from the hills of Mississippi, and right in between the water source. And the town is a huge Exxon Mobil petrochemical plant. And they are going through so many problems right now that the plant is causing leaching, which is causing environmental degradation, and it's spoiling the water. And this is not something that a lot of people are talking about. I had to do some research into it, and I would imagine that the oil industry is doing their damnedest to make sure this doesn't get out as much as it as it has already. 
but there's a, a double whammy that's going on. Not only is the the source of water is getting contaminated for a town of over 300,000 people, but on the other end is the Gulf of Mexico. And but due to sea level rise and things like that and climate change, the the aquifer is getting intruded upon by seawater. And so on the north end, you've got a huge industrial plant that is using the, the aquifer water, the, the city's drinking water. They're not only using it for their industrial uses, but they are contaminating it. And then on, then on the other end, we've got uh, saltwater intrusion. So water is a big deal. And I want to put that squarely on people's radars. And because we work in the built environment, water is one of those things that is creating the living component of what we're doing. It is vastly important to understand that we're not creating any more water, as, as Laura mentioned in the beginning of this. And, and we really need to understand what does a, a sustainable water system look like? And, and we can even go further to that than that to say, what does a regenerative water system look like? So our guest today, her name is Laura Allen, and she is the author of The Waterwise Home. She is also a co-founder of an organization called Gray Water Action. And this is a collaborative of, of educators who teach residents and tradespeople about affordable and simple household water systems that dramatically reduce water use and foster sustainable culture of water. She leads classes and workshops, including the first training program for professional gray water installers and participates in writing state government gray water and composting toilet codes. Uh, it is a great conversation. I loved where we ended up going with it. If you are interested in doing anything with a gray water system on your house, I hope that you check out Gray Water Action. Uh, or if you're just initially picking this up, go check out The Waterwise Home. It is a, a phenomenal book. I was not yet through with it by the time I recorded this, but man, I am so glad that this came onto my radar. And it was, it's going to be a book that is going to stay on my shelf for a long time if I don't end up giving it away before then, because that's what I love to do with books. Okay, without further ado, let's get into it and enjoy today's show. I am so pleased to have Laura Allen on the podcast today. Laura wrote a book that I'm in the middle of reading called The Water Wise Home. And I really wanted to have somebody on that could help expose us to, uh, to water because it's such an integral part of our lives. So Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And Laura, we were just talking about where, where we each live and you're in Oregon as well. You're down in Eugene. And I know that um, it is, is with a very heavy, heavy heart and time that we're recording this because wildfires are raging across our state and across the West Coast. And, and it just really underscores why this is such an important conversation. But I, I know a little bit about your background, but I want listeners to, to really get a sense of, of who you are and where you came from and how you ended up writing a book called The Water Wise Home. Great. Um. Yeah, and it is very, very smoky outside right now, and we're actually all stuck inside today in the last couple of days. Um, so I lived in California for um, up until just a couple of years ago, and I grew up with a home water system. With um, We had a neighborhood supply, and it was like a little spring that fed a tank for about, I'd say, 10 houses. And if a neighbor left their hose on overnight or if you know if the pipe broke it would actually like drain the tank down and we'd run out of water so kind of my baseline normal was we uh, had an impact on how, on our water system and it mattered what we did to the water and it wasn't until i moved away and went to college that i realized that that was actually not the typical experience of many people especially people living in cities um, where you are completely separated from your water supply, um, especially and where your water goes, but sewer plants are a little more visible and they're closer to where people generate the, the wastewater, but the water supply is pretty disconnected in most urban areas. 
and there was just absolutely no feedback on, you know, if we waste water, what does that mean? Is it affecting anyone? Like, how would I even know? There's just total disconnect between everyone using water in their daily lives and then where that water came from. What do you think it was? And I love that, that it was introduced into your consciousness from such a young age. Was that your parents that had that ethos that was driving it? What, what was that uh, like for them? Um, I think it was just the practicality of being on a, a small water system where you see the impacts of what you do. And anyone who's on a well or you know, any type of localized water supply where you actually see what happens when you, you like your pipe breaks and you use tons of water. Um, people on wells, you know, in the summertime, the groundwater table can drop and you have to be really conscious of not using too much. Um, so yeah, I think it was just, it wasn't an ethic around water per se, it was just the practical nature of we would, if we wasted water, we would actually run out of water. Oh, that's interesting to, to not come at it from the route that I was thinking. And the separation that you're talking about, that's what I find so perplexing is that we use so much water every day, but have no idea where it comes from or where it goes. And so whenever we are talking about the, the name of the show, obviously is regenerative real estate and people, they, they have a very hard time associating what, what is regeneration if I'm living in a city? What does that look like? And, and water is such a crucial thing. And in your book, you laid out quite beautifully in the very beginning, just the ecology of where, where water comes from and where it goes. And I'd love to give listeners just a highlight reel of where is this water going to? Yeah. And, and I had no idea. Yeah, many people don't. And that was actually what caused me to want to change how I used water was discovering that I didn't know where it came from or where it went. And that was really uncomfortable when I was, you know, when I'd moved away and I went to college in Berkeley, California. Um, and then I lived in Oakland, California for a long time and just realizing like, wow, I have actually no idea of this like basic thing that I use every single day and I completely take for granted. Um, and it really varies where people live, where their water comes from. Uh, and where it goes is a little simpler. It goes to the nearest water source. It's usually treated and then dumped into a river or bay or the ocean, wherever is the easiest place for the town to send it to. Um, but where it comes from, you know, it, com it comes from somewhere. So whether someone gets their supply from groundwater or whether it's a river supply, it would have been in nature somewhere if it we didn't come to our tap. So we're actually, you know, taking away from lots of other living things that rely on a, water, a clean water supply. And it does have a big impact on the environment. It's usually just a bit farther away. Um, like, you know, most, well, it depends on where you live, of course, but in California where I lived in the cities, the water came from very far away. So in the Bay Area, the Berkeley and Oakland, it comes from nearly a hundred miles away. And then I lived in Southern California for several years and it came from even farther away. So people are separated by, you know, hundreds of miles from their water source in some of these cities. Yeah, the, the Southern California water paradox with the, the Colorado rivers, it's really one of those examples that I think everybody needs to, to really follow because it's an international issue of what's going on there. But whenever we've got water coming in, and this is the strange thing is like, I, I know that there's a big debate over what we're adding to our water. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of those chemicals that, that we add to, to deem safe to drink? Um, well, the drinking water treatment, it, it does vary place to place, um, but typically it's filtered to get out particles and then it's disinfected and it's usually either chlorine or chloramine treatment to kill any um, bacteria or viruses that could be in the water and to keep it so there is some trace amounts of it as it goes through the pipe, piping system because otherwise there could be regrowth depending on the you know, the distance the water travels before it gets to somebody's tap. So, you know, our tap water is drinkable, um, which is, you know, not the norm around the world to have like potable water available to almost everyone, not everyone, but uh, most people who have a home in this country have potable drinking water coming into their, their home. Um, and we kind of treat that water the same, regardless of whether we're going to drink it or flush our toilets with it or take a shower. It's kind of this 
good quality water is used indiscriminately to water lawns and um, we use, you know, we use a lot of water in the United States on average. Um, and we don't really have to, we don't have, the thing that I think we're as a culture starting to understand is we don't have to use the same quality of water for everything we do. Um, drinking, we need a very, very clean water um, to drink, but for a lot of other uses, it doesn't have to be drinking water. We can use these, what we call alternate sources of water, and that way we can save our drinking water and preserve water in nature for other living things. Yes, Let, let's get into that because what, what perplexes me most is whenever we turn our sink on and we put a cup under it, it's drinking water, but once it hits the basin of our sink, then we, it, it switches, it's sewage. We need to get it off site and we ignore the rain that is hitting our roof and we're channeling it away from site as well. And so it's all just, if we're not using it, then, then it, it, it doesn't need to be here. What, can you explain some ways that we can either, how we can rethink this whole problem that we're finding ourselves in? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot we can do in our homes. And for me, when I started learning about water is to think about, well, you know, I, I can't have an immediate impact on this huge system I'm part of, but I can have an immediate impact on this small system, which is where I live, like the water that falls on the roof and the land, and then the water that comes out of the faucet and now is in my house and it's going to go down the drain to the sewer plant, um, but it doesn't have to. I can redirect that and use that beneficially in the landscape. We can think about, you know, how with the rainwater that falls, how can we keep that water on our site and use it into, they're called a rain garden. So it's making a part of your landscape like a bowl so it can hold water and then you plant appropriate plants that can, that like to be, you know, flooded temporarily when it's raining and then they can be dry for the dry season. Um, they're typically native plants. They typically, you know, live in different parts of wetland type areas um, that do dry out. And that way we can keep that rainwater on our site, have it soak down really deeply, um, soak our landscapes, and then also recharge the groundwater. Uh, the alternative is that rainwater rushes off of our property and then it picks up dirt from the street and all sorts of toxic things from, you know, brake dust and oil and little, just all sorts of stuff. And then it gets flushed into a waterway some way, so somewhere. So it could, the storm drain systems all connected to waterways. Um, so instead of this rainwater, which might turn into a big problem, it's called, you know, all this pollution from the urban environment, we can turn it into a solution in our own landscapes by keeping it on site. We can also collect rainwater in tanks and rain barrels and other ways where we're actually keeping it in its liquid form to use later. Um, so that's the rainwater. And then the other water that's com coming out of our faucets and then going down the drains, that's called gray water. And it's from our sinks, showers, and washing machines. So it's not the toilet, that's different. It's all the water that it's not drinkable anymore, but it's relatively clean. And if we just are mindful of what we put into the water, like what soaps we use, we can use, we can keep the water of good quality for our plants. So we can irrigate with that water and grow, you know, productive, lovely landscapes that aren't requiring potable water. I think that's, if, if we had to pinpoint an area that has the most disconnect is that we can actually use that water but we need to be mindful of what goes into it. I mean, what, what an interesting concept because we, we just kind of go, we're shopping off of price most often. And it's like, let me get that laundry detergent or let me get that soap or we're, you know, we're, we're putting skincare products on that, that we have no idea really what's in it. But if it's, if it's one of those things that it's coming back into your body, either through the food that you're eating, that you're growing outside. I just, do you find that a lot of people are, are disconnected from that, that you can actually use the water to, to go back into your site? Yeah, um, I think some people have heard of it and they think it's a great idea, but they don't know how to do it or they think it's not allowed or it just sounds too complicated. And then there's other people that have never heard of it, but when they do, they're like, wow, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, obviously, you know, I just wash my hands in this water Clearly, it's not like something terribly contaminated that now we need to send away to a treatment plant. Why can't I just put that in onto my tree outside? Or, so I think it, it makes a lot of sense to people. <clears throat> it's very intuitive to reuse water, and especially <clears throat> when it's your own water and you can really see what you put into it. You have a lot of control. 
So we call that controlling the inputs. When it's at the residential level, like it's your own home, you have just a lot of control over what you put into that water. And it's to, to get soaps and products that are good for your plants or not harmful to the plants. Um, it's not hard. It's just you have to think about it and be have a little bit of education and know what to get and what not to get. So it's not like you now, if you want to reuse your water, you have to go to some special store or um, buy something that's a lot more expensive. Um, it's that's not the case, but it is the case that you have to know what you're what you're getting and what's in your products. So it's sort of a it's a mental shift. Yeah, when my wife first had introduced gray water to me, I I got to tell you, I had a bit of a visceral reaction to to seeing her want to go at the plumbing with the sawzall. <laughs> and and if I'm already, I think a, a little bit more in tune with with wanting to have less of a negative impact with our our personal behavior and our housing. Uh, so I, I can only imagine somebody that that is fresh into this, the reaction that they would have is what what do you need to do? Is that an expensive endeavor to start thinking about how you can reuse water with the gray water? Or is this something that you've got to have a lot of expertise in? It's going to cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. Where do you really see uh, people gravitating towards whenever they're first getting into it? Um, well, there's there's lots of different options. If somebody really wants to just start saving water, they can get a bucket and it can be pretty much free or the cost of a bucket if you can't find one. Um, you can collect what's called clear water. Like if you're gonna take a shower, you turn on the water, it's usually starts out cold and we usually typically let that water run down the drain and that's actually not even gray water, that's totally clean water. And that water you can collect in a bucket and now you have a half a bucket full of water that you could water your house plants with, you could take it outside, um, you could flush your toilet with it, you can, it's called bucket flushing where you pour it right into the bowl, it causes the toilet to flush. Um, water's heavy and so that can that can definitely get old hauling water around but it can be if, if you want to take that first step of like seeing this is like I don't want to waste this, this is a, you know, a vital resource, you can get a bucket. Um, in your sinks, like in your kitchen sink, you can wash your dishes in a bowl and then take that outside. There's lots of really super simple things to do that take more effort on on our part. And then having a gray water system, that's when you make the water flow out by itself. And the simplest system is from a washing machine. Um, our washing machines have an internal pump in them and it pumps out the water. So we can use that pump to pump the water toward the landscape itself. And we always put in, it's called a diverter valve. So it's a way where you can control the gray water either to the gray water system, which is going outside or to the sewer or septic. So you have control, like it's kind of like an on off switch, but it's really just a directing at one place or the other. And with the laundry system, you don't have to change your plumbing at all because you're collecting it from the washing machine, which is an appliance itself. And so in many places, you don't even need a permit if you follow basic health and safety guidelines. In Oregon, you do, um, need a gray water permit for anything, but in like California, you can do this with no permit. Um, you don't have to ask or tell anyone. In a lot of places, your water agency will give you money to do it. They'll give you a rebate. Um, there's a handful, maybe half dozen in California that do that. And then you direct that out into your landscape to water your larger plants, like your trees or your bushes. So that can be a pretty easy do-it-yourself project. And then, you know, that's the simplest side of things. And then you can go up to where you do have to cut into your plumbing, your drainage plumbing and redirect it. And then that takes more skill level. And if you hire someone, it's more expensive because you're doing plumbing work. Um, and then sometimes you need to collect it in a tank and pump it out because you might have an upward sloping yard or you might have to cross a patio or something. And so that's gonna add cost. Um, and then, you know, going to more complex systems, you can get into your ten, twenty thousand dollar systems that monitor all the water and you can look on your phone and see how much gray water you used um, that month or if it runs out of gray water, it can switch over to another supply like rainwater or the municipal supply. Um, and it would operate just like a traditional irrigation system with, with different zones and everything automatic. So that's kind of like the Tesla of gray water. And then there's the really simple just, and they're not, they're not better or worse than each other. They're just different. Um, 
the simple gray water systems cost less and they're also much easier to maintain because they're simpler. And really we just want to get the water to our plants. And so how we do that, um, there's different ways to do that. Very Where simple. do you think we're going, Laura? Do you think we're gonna see more houses with, with more complex systems? Um, yeah, you know, people that have, are building like, um, you know, lead platinum or net zero homes or buildings th that type where it's, um, there's more money involved and um, that's the kind of type of home that would have a, a complex system. They, they are really expensive. So the average person just doesn't have that amount of money to dedicate to a gray water system, but there are people that do and, and that's the kind that they would like. Um, but the average home, I mean, I'm just looking in my my neighborhood, there's single family homes all over, with all have yards, you know, all these people have washing machines and they all have plants that irrigate. These neighborhoods, everyone could have a simple washing machine system and irrigate a bunch of their, their trees and bushes with that. Do you think they could irrigate their lawn or is that just still incompatible with with what you're trying to do, because I, I find it's quite hard to get people to to think outside of their lush green grass. Yeah, that is a really good point. Um, so I think gray water is a great, it starts a lot of conversations and thoughts about like you brought up before our products. It's a great time to think about what are we actually putting in this water and what before it went into that water, it's actually touching our bodies. Like if it's our personal care products, shampoos and whatnot. Um, so it's a good time to think about what's really in that and do I actually want to be using these products. And then with the landscape, when you find out that the simple gray water systems are really good for the larger plants, they don't irrigate a lawn. That's not um, possible in a code compliant way um, in this country to irrigate a lawn with a simple system. You can do it with the sophisticated systems, the you know $20,000 systems, but you cannot do it with your couple hundred dollars of system. And so begs, you know, should we really be having lawns? Um, I think simple gray water really directs people to having more climate appropriate landscapes. In a Mediterranean climate, a lawn just does, isn't, it's not really appropriate in climates that need, it needs to be irrigated all the time um, for in, in a backyard situation. And it's not to say you can't have a lawn. Like most yards, you're not gonna have enough gray water to water the entire yard. So you could dedicate the gray water to your larger plants and you could keep the lawn. Um, sometimes people think about their lawn and think, well, I don't actually need such a big lawn. I do want a small lawn because I have some little dogs or I have little kids and I do want a little patch of grass and that's totally fine. Or we can go to the park, you know, to get to the patch of grass. Um, but there's lots of unused lawns. And so it can be a good time to really think, do I actually need to have this green strip along my sidewalk or this, you know, front yard lawn that I never go to. Um, so yeah, gray water is not, it's not just a, sometimes people think it's going to, they can keep everything exactly the same and just switch over. And now I'm going to have this giant lawn with my gray water system. And it, it's not really like that. What about black water? And I'm, I want to introduce this by a meme. I think I saw on Instagram that said, repeat after me, I will not poop into clean water anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a, I got a chuckle about that. And this is really where, you know, composting toilets is definitely in people's consciousness now. Uh, we've actually seen them in, in, in some of, you know, we, we help people transact real estate at our company Latitude. And we've actually seen composting toilets. Maybe they not be in, in every bathroom, but it might be in a, in a little garden structure out back or in the basement where there's a workshop. Are you starting to see those pick up in popularity? Um, composting toilets are a great option because they don't require water and they can work pretty much anywhere. Um, to have it in a home instead of a flush toilet, that takes a pretty, it takes a shift that I think a lot of people aren't really ready to do um, because you have to manage your excreta. You have to do something with it typically. Well, there's different, there's the composting toilets where you collect the material and then you compost it outside. And those are really affordable, they're really simple, they work really well, but they require a person to actually move, you know, poop somewhere and then compost it. And then there's t systems that maybe are in the homes you're describing that are, there's a big chamber below the bathroom and so the, the person doesn't really have to be as involved. And those are quite um, costly. 
mean, the sewer system is totally costly, so I'm not saying it's like more costly or, or less overall, but it, just to retrofit your home to have that, it is expensive to do that. Or it requires planning in the design because it requires a lot, much larger space than most bathrooms typically have below them for that big chamber. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't see an uptake in how many people are wanting to do that. Um, but there is, you know, if we really were going to scale up or when we are, <laughs> one of the two, with composting toilets, it could be a centralized composting system, much like we have now. We have a trash bin, we have a recycling bin, we have a green bin that we can put our compost in also. And if we wanted to scale up composting human manure, we could have a separate bin that people could take from their home and just put it outside and someone else takes it and composts it, if that's making sense. So, um, you know, in the future, looking forward, if we were going to scale it up, it would be in a, where someone else is composting all the material off site. And not That's every so interesting. person is compost having their own backyard human or composting system. Yeah, we so explain more about about the whole black water system is it, outside of that. Is there any other applications of, uh, of black water that that we're not doing right now that we should be doing? Yeah, and so so we currently have a system where all of our what we call wastewater, which I would love to change that word because it's not wastewater unless you waste it. Um, but we call it wastewater, so I'll just use that that term. It's all combined. It's the gray water. It's from the sink showers, the toilets. You know, everything goes together in one pipe, and it leaves our homes. If we're on a municipal system, if we have a septic system, then it all goes out one pipe into our, our septic system in, in the yard somewhere and is treated there and then soaks into the ground. And so in both those scenarios, we can reuse all of that water. It's, it's not something that someone can just do on their own because there's more risk involved with when you add the toilet water, you're adding potential pathogens, human born pathogens, which could sicken people. So you have to be a lot more cautious when you're doing anything with toilet water. Um, and that's not like a do it yourself type project, whereas gray water can be, it's, you know, we know it's totally different quality of water. Um, so in the septic systems, if people, you know, don't, if they're, if they have a septic system at their home, their water goes out into this tank where the solids settle, the liquids are, you know, float, and then that typically goes into this leach field, which soaks the water deep down below the ground away from you know, people. There are systems that you can adapt an existing septic system where it aerates that tank and cleans the water through oxygen, which is the same process that happens at our, our municipal treatment plants. You're cleaning it with um, oxygen loving bacteria. And you can clean that water and then that effluent can be used for subsurface irrigation. Some states allow it, some states don't. So is, is this legal or not? That's a com that question is gonna depend on where you live. But technically, yes, we can clean that water relatively easily just by adding oxygen into it. And then it can be used for subsurface irrigation. So we can irrigate our landscapes with that. That's totally possible. Um, and then the other scenario is when your wastewater goes to the treatment plant. So it's getting mixed with everybody's wastewater, um, there are a lot more projects that are looking at how can we reuse that water from the treatment plants. And in the last you know, 20 years, the most common way to reuse it is to, to clean it up somewhat, and then it's called recycled water. So it's non-potable. It comes back somewhere in a purple pipe. It's usually used to irrigate golf courses or other really large water users. And there's a fair amount of recycled water in, in dry places like California. Um, so that's pretty, um, you know, accepted, you know, it's expensive to get that plant up and running, but there's a lot of recycled water being used and more planned. And then taking it one step farther, well, you know, all, all of the water we have has been around for the entire, you know, the existence of Earth, so it's all recycled water, really, like we are drinking dinosaur pee, or who knows, you know, what that water, what it traveled through in the past. So we can clean any water to be drinking water quality again. So now we have the wastewater plant and let's say we want to clean it more than recycled water. Um, so there's, it's called um, potable reuse. So we're reusing water, returning it to potable quality. And there's two ways it's happening. Um, hope this isn't too technical, but one way it's called indirect. So you're treating it to potable standards and then mostly people are, are they're injecting it back into the groundwater and then they're pulling it back up and then sending it into the drinking water system again. So it's sort of a, the natural barrier of going back into the earth. Um, so that's indirect um, potable reuse. And then now there's treatment plants that are direct potable reuse. So they're treating the water, 
to drinking water quality. So it comes out of the wastewater plant. It goes through very advanced treatment. It's very clean and now it goes back into the drinking water system. So that really is, I think, the future of recycling water is creating these closed loop systems where we're cleaning the water back to how it looked as clean as it was before and then we're using it again and it's coming full circle. Um, and there's some of those that have been around um, for a while and there are more being planned. What happens with, with all the chemicals that are in the system? Like they're getting filtered out somehow. Where do yeah. they go? Um, they are discharged and I, I'm not going to be able to answer like super technical questions about that, but they use, they're called mem membrane um, bioreactors, MBRs, and they're very, 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 very tiny filters where only water molecules can get through them and everything else is left out on the other side. Hmm. Oh, so that's where, you know, in your book, you had talked about watersheds and I, I really appreciate that because it ties in I, whenever we're asking people where they're from now, uh, or we're spotlighting them, I really like to include what watershed do you live in? Uh, but you had, you had mentioned that, look, there's, if, if our water is going into our watersheds again, and there's things like uh, pharmaceuticals in our water supply or uh, trace elements of, of whatever it is, maybe the chemicals that we're using in our skincare products. It's just that to me is like, well, where does that go? I mean, even if we're filtering it with our, our ground somehow through the whole sewage process, I, it just, it begs the question for me of like, well, it's not disappearing. No. And t in most treatment plants, so the ones I just described, those are, are not typical. I don't think there's any in Oregon. I don't even know of big re reuse, non-potable reuse in Oregon. Um, so most treatment plants around the country and the world just treat it minimally. I mean, it's treated, it's disinfected. There's not like tons of, you know, it's, it's treated, but it, they're not taking out all those uh, micro pollutants. They're not taking out the pharmaceuticals. None of that is coming out. It's they're taking out the nutrients and the big stuff and then disinfecting it to kill viruses and whatnot. And it only t goes through the treatment plant. I maybe 24 hours, like it's not a very long time. And then it's discharged into a waterway. And so all those things you're describing are now in the water um, where there's a lot of life amphibians, fish, you know, they absorb that through their skin. So it causes a lot of problems to um, aquatic organisms because they're getting it directly into their bodies. Um, if that water were to be put onto land, a lot of those constituents would actually decompose over time, but they take longer to break down than the 24 hours it takes to go through a wastewater treatment plant. So one solution is to not put that water in, like to keep it on our land, let it uh, compost, basically break down and keep it away from aquatic life. Do you think it's it's more practical? Maybe not practical is that's the wrong word. But in order to enact change, do you think that we should be focusing on the municipal side of things, or should it be more of the personal behavior and what can you do with with your own habitat? Um, I think we need to do both. There, with our cities already constructed, we are um, limited. Mostly, it's like a financial limitation. We can't just like redo everything. It's, extremely expensive. So we can do a lot in our own homes by reusing in simple ways the water we can reuse and making smart choices about our landscaping, doing a climate appropriate landscaping. You know, there's tons of things we can do in our own homes. And then we can look at our municipal treatment systems and see, well, what can they do? Because um, we're not going to keep all the water in our own landscapes, most likely. I mean, unless there's like some catastrophe and everything's broken, then of course we're going to figure it out. But in the current um, way things are set up, we're not, not a, you know, every site is different. There's some sites that are just really difficult, really expensive, but there's a lot that aren't. There's a lot where we can simply reuse our own water. Um, and so then we can look at our municipal plants and see what they can do. And maybe it's uh, recycled water going to large users. Maybe it's um, agriculture. You know, there's all sorts of places to put that water that's gonna be beneficial. And maybe it's a full, Non uh, reuse system where it's going to be reused back to the people, but that those kind of systems are typically going to be considered where when it's necessary, like in really dry places where there's a lot of shortages. Hmm. With with the people that are very interested in working on the their local site, mm -hmm. and 
they want to go beyond the clean bucket approach. Where do the, what resources do they have to turn to? I would imagine that across the country, it's not as uh, widely accessible to have gray water experts be able to, to consult with them. Yeah, um, Gray Water Action, the nonprofit that I work with, we do a lot of education and we do, did a lot of in-person classes, but with COVID, we're shifting to online. So we have some online courses where we're teaching people all about Gray Water and, you know, it's remote, so you can take it from anywhere. Um, so I, that's a good resource. We have tons of webinars that we've done that are recorded. Our website really does have a lot of information for people on it, and we're expanding our online courses currently. Um, and then, uh, you know, people, it's great to, books are really useful. Um, I know no, there's nothing that's better than being able to see it and touch it and get, you know, hands-on experience, but when you can't do that, then I would just point people to the online resources and the books. Great, and I, I will plug your book, The Waterwise Home, How to Conserve, Capture and Reuse Water in Your Home and Landscape. Uh, I know it's, for me, it was, it was one of those books that I was like, hey, I know Laura's coming on and I really wanna be able to dive into to this concept uh, with her and, and have somewhat of a, of a conception of what your background and expertise is. But I just, I, I find that it's a, a fascinating book uh, I really look forward to getting to the rest of it because I, I'll find I'll pick it up and it's so insightful that I gotta, I just go down these rabbit holes. Uh, but I will, I will plug that in our show notes. And and I love that you're doing online courses with Gray Water Action and and how we're shifting because of COVID and having to, to disseminate our work, in a manner that we can still save safe. Uh, but hopefully, you're you're finding that it is further reaching than what you're doing in, in person. And we would love to, to be a part of helping to take part in that and, and as well as spread it. Uh, is, is there any other area here, Laura? I, there's so much uh, to cover, but are we missing any of the, the highlights that we really need to be talking about whenever we're, we're thinking about water and gray water or black water systems? Um, I think what we're missing is it's really fun and empowering to do to change your house and make it where instead of being part of this big problem, we're a part of this really exciting solution and we can use this water and we get there's lots of benefits to it. And one of them is it's just fun. It's fun to know like, wow, my I'm doing laundry and now I'm watering those four fruit trees over there and I'm going to eat fruit from them later on. You know, things like that, I think are just, it's fun to be more connected. And, you know, water is such a vital thing that, it, you know, everyone understands we need to protect water. And it's something small that we can do, but it's actually a really big shift of stepping away from this big system that was created to keep separate us from our water and have us not see the impacts that we're having on the, the environment. And we can just kind of start reconnecting little by little, piece by piece, our own homes. So it's, our homes can be you know, being more productive and more sustainable. I, I love that you brought it there. That was a great way to, to really book in this. Laura, how can, how can people get in touch with you? If, are you looking um, for people to, to reach out outside of the Gray Water Action and, and the WaterWise Home book? Um, through our website and we do, we also have a forum on the website. So if people start learning and have technical questions, they can go to our forum and post them there. And I, I'll probably be the one to answer, but it's nice to put it in a public space so other people that have the same question can see and you know learn from each other. Um, so yeah, you can get in touch with me there. My email is just laura at graywateraction.org. So if people wanna email me, they're welcome to, but they can also find me through our website, graywateraction.org. Oh, that's fantastic. Laura, thank you so much for your time. This is, this is really enlightening and and just such a pleasure to know that there's people out there doing amazing work like this. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, that is a wrap. Thank you for tuning in. Before we go, I wanna give you a behind the scenes look at what happens after we do these interviews. Because I take it and I do a little bit of editing and then I send it to the podcast guest and I tell them that we are creating a community of change agents where I really want 
you, the listeners and the interviewees to be able to exchange ideas and thoughts and collaborate on projects. Or even if you want to reach out and say, oh my God, you know, that was really insightful. You said this, or, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think about that? Because collaboration is really what's going to get us into a more regenerative, a more sustainable future. And so what I tell them is come join us on the Facebook group, Regenerative Real Estate, and be active. And so I invite you to do the same thing. Find us on Facebook, the Regenerative Real Estate group. Become a part of the community. Share your energy. Share your enthusiasm. Because I know you're out there. I get emails from you. Uh, at our company, Latitude, we get a lot of support from you. And it's just so appreciated. What we find in the podcast world is that ratings and reviews make everything go round. It is always appreciated whenever we get some love from you in this endeavor. So if you feel so inclined to, to support us, please do so. And with that, please subscribe, share this with your friends, and we will catch you later down the road. Take care.